Hello and welcome. Uh, this presentation is going to focus on the coming webinar on Thursday, May 14th at 6.30 p.m. The topic for that webinar is a vision for world peace, the need for universal values. It's our second peace talk series here in the Philippines. Our focus this time will be on Senate Bill 1224, an act institutionalizing comprehensive values education in the K-12 curriculum as a core subject, including good manners and right conduct and for other purposes, enacted by the Senate and the House of Representatives of the Philippines in Congress assembled. We will look at a few key elements of this Senate bill and then we will focus on how those particularly can be addressed by the UPF educational initiatives. We believe that the Universal Peace Federation has a unique niche in order to be able to help the government and the students and the nation uh, really accomplish the ideals of this act, this Comprehensive Values Education Act, C-V-E-A, as it is known by the acronym. On page one and two of the CVEA, it talks about the Declaration of Principles and says it's the role of students in youth and uh, nation building to promote and protect their physical, moral, spiritual, intellectual, and social well-being. We will address that. On page two, three times, it talks about the goal of patriotism and nationalism. That will also be addressed. Later on page two, it talks about strengthening ethical and spiritual values, developing moral character and personal discipline. We surely can contribute in this area. The next page, page three, values education. It emphasizes that in values education, we have to address the underlying principles, these universal principles, interreligious principles, intercultural principles. And this is one of our hallmarks. Again, on page three, it talks about good manners and right conduct, universally accepted proper modes of behavior. We have to understand very clearly what is goodness. That has to be defined and it will be defined at the outset of the presentation. On page five, it talks about the coverage of comprehensive values education. And it says values education as herein provided shall encompass universal human, ethical morals, spiritual and or interreligious values, among others. Again, the foundation that UPF has can make a unique and very important contribution to achieving this concept. Finally, on page five, it says that this CVEA Act must build within students respect for oneself, others and elders. It must be intercultural and interreligious diversity, as well as gender equality, bringing into it nationalism and global citizens, citizenship within our students. So if we want to summarize kind of the areas that we have talked about and that we will address, not in the order that we presented, but in the chronological order in addressing these issues, we will first talk about universal principles and then the concept of goodness from an interreligious perspective. We will go into the ideal of good character and how that is needed to build patriotism and nationalism. We will talk about gender equality and finally moral behavior. But before we go into this, I want to do a quick review of the World Summit that was held in February of this year, 2020, in Korea. Some of you may have been there. If not, it's a good point to start because it was a really a very large program that addressed many, many different areas. In this World Summit, it was held at the Kentext International Exhibition Center. There were 10,000 participants, nearly 3,000 from the international community from 170 nations. 120 current and former heads of state were there, 100 speakers, deputy speakers, ministers, and parliamentarians. 500 media people from 45 nations, religious leaders, 400 from all faith traditions, university presidents, 50, and 400 leading academia. The business community and investors, again, a very good representative representation. This is the Kintext International Exhibition Center in Seoul, and some of the main speakers at that event 
Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, recently retired from the United Nations, former Speaker of the House of the American Congress, Newt Gingrich, current Prime Minister of Cambodia, Hun Sen, the current Vice President of our country in the Philippines, uh, Lenny Robredo, current Vice President of Myanmar, Henry Van Thieu, and you can see here the 5,000 delegates from the, really from the adult side. Mother Moon spoke on several occasions, sharing her heart. Uh, the different breakout sessions included media, a summit council, where heads of state and first ladies were there, parliamentarians, interreligious, economic, academic, and youth and students. The uh, academic side, IAPD, was formed. That's the International Association of Academians for Peace. And uh, they had a series of kind of smaller breakout sessions under this umbrella. The International Conference on the Unity of Sciences and the Unification Thought Institute was one session. The God and Science Conference, the 26th International Conference on the Unity of the Sciences, the World Peace University President's Congress, the God Conference, CAUSA, and the Professor's World Peace Academy. And here, you can see 5,000 youth and students who also gathered at this Kentex International Center. The declaration from this world summit in part says, the heavenly unified world is a global community of peace-loving citizens whose tireless efforts in the areas of interdependence, mutual prosperity, and I will highlight this, universal values help resolve the conflicts and discord caused by religion, ethnicity, and nationality. So a key element of our presentation and the focus of this webinar that will be coming on Thursday is the area of universal values. So let's address that first, universal principles. The need for universal principles. If you want to be an architect, well, you study the principles of architecture. Because if you build that building without those principles, then that building will tilt or fall down. If you want to be an electrician, then you study the principles of electrical engineering. And then if you violate those principles, well, disaster strikes and that building may burn down. If you want to be a civil engineer, you study the principles, the fundamental principles of engineering. And if that bridge falls down, you will be responsible, no matter what. You have no excuses. So underlying each of our disciplines, there are fundamental principles. And this is what the CVEA is asking us to address. What are these fundamental principles of good character and right conduct of comprehensive values education? Everything in the universe operates by principles, whether it's the molecular world or in our solar systems. And it wasn't until we could address and live and apply these principles that we could actually fly. We had to understand and apply the principles of aerodynamics, then we could fly. We dream of peace, we see peace in nature, especially after the COVID virus <laughs> pandemic and so much of our polluting transportation systems have been shut down. But is that enough? No, we want peace in ourselves. We want these fundamental principles of peace. We need to understand and live by them. Kofi Annan, the former Secretary General of the United Nations, said universal values are also more acutely needed in this age of globalization than ever before. This is the key point. If we can get these universal values, then we can begin to build interdependent and mutually prosperous societies, nations, and a world. Dennis Preger, uh, a Jewish scholar in America, and without shared values, how does a society survive? In fact, it doesn't. So we are at the cusp and the urgent need of identifying these universal values. What are they? Well, let's go first by the criteria that they have. If these values are universal, number one, it means they must apply everywhere. Africa, Asia, America. It doesn't matter where you live, the color of your skin or the color of your passport. These principles must apply. They must apply in the past, present, and future. They're beyond time and beyond space. In other words, things that are unchanging really are very, very valuable. Diamonds and gold, they don't change. Diamonds don't scratch, gold doesn't rust. And so when we discover these principles, it will be like the diamonds of building a sustainable society. 
They must be scalable. In other words, the same principles that apply within me as an individual will apply in my family, society, nation, and world. They must apply to all cultures and religions without favoritism of one over the other. Father Moon had this book written. Uh, it took about 10 years, 40 different scholars, and they researched all the world scriptures, all the written and oral traditions of the world. And then they discovered 164 common themes within the world's traditions. So my point is this, when we discover these universal values that we will share with you today, if these teachings are universally true, then they should help you be a better Christian or better Buddhist or better Jew or better Confucianist or better Hindu or better Muslim. Your religion will not matter. In other words, you do not need to change your religion. That's not one of the objectives of what we are trying to do. But don't get too comfortable because, well, we do need to change some things, our attitudes, priorities in life, behavior, character, and culture. But changing religion, that's, that won't accomplish what we're trying to do. It will probably make us more divided than ever before. Finally, these principles must be scientific, logical, and very, very simple. So simple that if a farmer out in the field cannot read and write, he could recognize those principles instantaneously. Well, what are these principles? How many are there? Two. Very simple. The two underlying principles of character education and everything in society ultimately hinge on what we call the dual purpose principle of mind and body. We will define that as the essence of goodness. And the second one is the pair system principle, male and female, really is the essence of true love. The mind-body relationship, this is like a pillar. And when you build a building, you need to put the pillar in. Let me go back to this slide. And you can see that the mind and body are vertical in nature. So that means the priority is very important in our vertical structure. When you build a building, you put the pillars in first. If you want the building to be strong, you have to put the, build, you have to put the pillars straight and strong. The priorities are essential. We need both mind and body. Both are necessary, both are good, but the priority is actually the key here. Starts off with the mind taking a higher position over the body, and then the family takes a higher position over the individual. The community has a higher position than the family. They're both necessary and both good, but the priority is important. And the nation takes a higher priority over the community the world over the nation and ultimately God. So this process is, the seed of this is within the family. That's the first time we start this structure. It's like the first step on a ladder. You want to build a ladder that goes up higher and higher? Well, the first step is within the family. The relationship between parents and children, filial piety. We will emphasize this throughout this presentation. The second, principle is the pair system between man and woman. And this is horizontal in nature. It's the beam. And if you have the pillars and beams correct, then you have the basic structure. You can put the doors and windows wherever you want. You can put the curtains and carpets wherever you want. But you cannot change the pillars and beams. You can use the building for many things. It can be an office building, a shopping center. It could be a parking lot. It could be a government, you know, a government court of law but you cannot change the pillars and beams. That's why when the CVEA is looking at and asking for us to identify the underlying principles of character building, this is critically important. It's actually the right focus that needs to be. If the pillars and beams are strong, the building will sustain itself. But you remove the pillars and beams and that building will implode. Our character will implode. Our families will implode. Our societies nations and the world. And the fact that there have been a rise and fall of civilizations throughout history, precisely because we have not identified clearly and lived accordingly by these universal principles. Which is more important, the pillar or the beam? Important question. Well, we can easily answer that question by looking at nature. Nature has pillars and beams. We call it the trunk and branch. Well, which is bigger, the trunk or the branch? which is bigger, the trunk or the branch. This is the oak tree. 
and the redwood tree, which is bigger, the trunk or the branch. So this is an important lesson for us to learn. The mind and body is of primary importance. Man has mind and body and woman has mind and body. So before my gender, my character counts. Man has mind and body, woman has mind and body. This tells us that my character is more important than my gender. We need both. It's not an either or situation. It's an issue of priorities. So we've started to address some of the fundamental elements of this CVEA program. Let's now look at another one, the concept of goodness from an interreligious dimension, which again the CVEA asks us to do. The dual purpose principle of mind and body. The mind is the internal invisible nature and it should give direction to the body, the external nature, which is visible. Again, we need both, but this direction is critically important. In fact, everything has a mind and body. We do, animals, we call it instinct, and the body, we call the body. And the instinct gives direction to the body. The birds fly in a V formation, this is unlearned activity. The turtles swim for 20 years in the ocean to come back to the same beach where they hatched. Again, unlearned behavior. But it's that unlearned behavior, that mind, that directs the behavior. In plants, the mind is called a response mechanism. If you put a seed in the ground, it doesn't matter if it's right side up or upside down. The roots know they should go down, the stem knows it should go up. So the response mechanism built into the seed gives the farmer freedom. He doesn't have to check. What if the farmer had to plant every seed right side up in order for it to grow? Wow, how difficult it would be to be a farmer. But he could just throw the seeds and they will grow by themselves because there is an internal nature. There is a principle within the seed directing the growth of the seed. And when it grows, the sunflower will track the sun from sunrise to sunset. Again, response mechanism, unlearned behavior. In the molecular world, Einstein taught us that energy is the basis of particles. But it doesn't stop there because particles create atoms and atoms create molecules. But the mind, the internal directive nature of the molecular world is natural law. Let's take an example, water, H2O. The two hydrogen atoms align themselves in a 104.5 degree angle to the oxygen everywhere. It's universal. It doesn't change. So we have discovered this universal principle within even the atomic structure of the water molecule. Energy without a mind or energy without direction, what do we call it? We call it a bomb. It's destructive. It's a lot of energy, but there's no direction. So there's a body, but no mind. It is destructive. So therefore, we have to focus on really character education developing and strengthening the mind. This is very simple. The relationship of mind and body in the animal, plant, and the molecular world is unlearned, instinctual, automatic, and pre-programmed, but not the mind of human beings. Our relationship of mind and body, we participate in that alignment. We have responsibility to align the mind and body correctly. And when we look at science, they're looking for the difference between animals and human beings. They thought it was social networks, but no, it wasn't. Or language, no. Or even tool-making ability, no. The uniqueness of human beings is that we have responsibility. And this responsibility gives us uniqueness of purpose, meaning, value, and freedom, far beyond anything in the animal kingdom. Religions are trying to emphasize this point, the Bible says, ask and it will be given, seek and you will find, knock and it will be opened. So what if you don't ask, seek or knock? <laughs> what will happen? Don't expect anything to happen. We have responsibility. We have to initiate and even our relationship with God. In the Quran, there's no compulsion in religion because we have responsibility. And in Buddhism, it is you who must make the effort. Great people of the past, they will only show the way. Our parents, religious leaders, teachers, we have responsibility. Yes, they can guide, direct, and pray, and teach, but ultimately we have responsibility. Have no deprived thoughts, Confucianism. Who is going to clean your mind? 
each of us have that responsibility to control our mind. And finally, in Hinduism, the mind is the best friend or the mind will remain your greatest enemy. UNESCO is emphasizing this, saying that war begins in the minds of men. So it is in the minds of men that we must make the defenses of peace. And if we are going to fulfill these CVEA criteria, then we must focus on educating character, which focuses on developing strong, healthy minds. We need education to be smart because we are not animals. Each of us is a genius. That will be unique. But universal is we need education to be good. And that is universal. The uniqueness of being smart is isolated to each individual differently. But the universal principle of goodness we all need to live by. The problem with our education system is we emphasize being smart and we teach tests and give knowledge and think this is enough. We hope the kids are good, but the priority is wrong and we often have a big heart, we're very arrogant, and a, or a big head and a small heart, and so the priority is wrong. American President Theodore Roosevelt said to educate a man in mind and not in morals is to educate a menace to society. So we have to change our priorities, even in the educational realm. We must emphasize and teach to be good, and on top of that, then we need to teach to be smart. Normal head, big heart, and self-regulation occurs. So this comes to the first point. Can we find a universal definition of what it means to be good? The hard part is all religions must agree without violating their religious tenets. They won't and they shouldn't. So this is the hard part. No one's been able to do that, so we kind of just set religion aside and think, well, maybe it doesn't have so much to do within the education of character and we just want to teach external elements of character. No, we need to teach this internal element of what is good character. And we have to start by defining what is goodness. Good manners, right conduct. G-M-R-C. Father Moon said the definition of goodness that is universal is very simple. It's live for the sake of others. When we live for others, we are public-minded, we are altruistic, we're willing to make sacrifices. And the opposite makes the point even stronger. We are selfish and we don't care for others. We'll steal and cheat, maybe even kill. Living for the sake of others. But this is found in all religions. In the Bible, whoever seeks to gain his life will lose it. Take, take, take. Well, you lose your life. You lose your friends. You lose your value and purpose. But whoever loses his life will preserve it. When we give and live for others, we preserve our life. Again in the Bible, let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. Goodness is in relationships, not your own good. And again in the Bible, do nothing from selfishness or conceit, but in humility count others better than yourselves. Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect, Jesus taught. And he told us how to do it. Well, if you want to be perfect, go and sell your possessions and give them to the poor, then come and follow me. So it's when we live for the sake of others, when we give for other people unselfishly, we find perfection of our own character because then our character represents that of God, our Heavenly Father, and represents that of Jesus. Not only live for the sake of others, but die for the sake of others. Father, forgive them. Die without resentment. This is amazing. This is the root of Christianity. But it's not just within Christianity. It's in all religions. Do not expect in giving any increase for thyself, the Quran teaches. And in the Quran, it has this concept of ishyar, which is called altruism. In the Quran, uh, Muslim tradition, it means preferring others to oneself. You prefer others to yourself. You live for the sake of others. Allah does not love those who are arrogant and boastful. <laughs> In Buddhism, cut the love of yourself and develop the path to peace. If you love yourself, you cannot find peace because love myself, I take, 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 take. Then you cut the path to peace. But peace means giving and living for others. And then we find peace. Buddha also taught misers, selfish people, do not go to heaven. But noble men find joy and generosity. A miser, a stingy, selfish person, does not go to heaven. But we find joy in generosity. That is the, 
the character that we are trying to inculcate in our students. Confucianism, to nourish the mind, there is nothing better. Make your desires few. You want a healthy mind? Then don't be selfish. A selfish mind is unhealthy. A healthy mind is unselfish. Hinduism, of sacrifices, the sacrifice performed by those who desire no reward, this is the nature of goodness. Sacrifice without reward. Give for the sake of others. Wow. This is universal. It's very important what we are discovering here. And Father Moon has given us really the key to understand these universal values. In Father Moon's autobiography, he said this, a true life is a life in which we abandon our private desires and live for the public good. This is a truth taught by all major religious leaders, past, present, east, and west. It is true. Let me emphasize, as I did in the beginning, you do not need to change your religion to be good because this universal principle is already in each religion. It's already there. We just need to bring it out and kind of use it to teach the importance of good character. And it's beyond just religion. It's in our so, uh, psychological makeup as well. Sigmund Freud, the father of psychoanalysis, said delayed gratification. He called it an important component of emotional intellect, intelligence and maturity. Delay your gratification. Don't do something just for the immediate gratification, but delay that. In a book called The Good Society, the most profound decisions about justice are made not by individuals, but by individuals thinking on behalf of institutions. When we think of others, we become good. That's amazing. And Martin Luther King Jr. in America, the civil rights leader, life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? Are you living for the sake of others? What are you doing for others? This is the character that needs to be put into the heart, mind, and culture of the students. It has to be brought into the school system and into our laws and into our nations. Mother Teresa put it very simply, give, but give until it hurts. The next point on the CVEA that we want to talk about is good character relating to patriotism and nationalism. Father Moon's concept, live for the sake of others. Well, when we apply that, live for the sake of others, then let's ask a question. Who is the first other that we live for? We live for others, but who's the first one? <laughs> it's very simple. It's our parents. And so children learning to live for the sake of their parents is the beginning point. It is the model. It is the seed. It is the foundation of learning to be good within my family, then later in my school, in my society, nation, and world. So this is why the family is so important. When children live for the sake of their parents, we call it filial piety. And this creates the proper mind-body relationship. Children don't think of themselves first. They think of the well-being of their parents first. And this creates good character. The family is the foundation, fundamental foundation for the development of good character. If, as the government of the Philippines, the Senate and the House, and the Department of Education want to institute good manners and right conduct and the comprehensive values education, it has to focus on the family and bringing within this context these values. This is our North Star. It's our conscience. So if a child has a very clear conscience and they're confused, well, should I smoke? Should I take drugs? Shall I drink? Shall we have sex? He just has to close his eyes or her eyes and ask a question. Will this make my parents happy? And then suddenly the mind becomes very clear. Oh, can I go home and say, Daddy, I learned to smoke. I learned to drink. I learned, I had sex today, but I'm not married. I don't know. It becomes very clear. They won't do that. Then the, the government and regulation comes from within their heart, not from outside, forcing students to do what is right. That will not work. It has not worked. It never will work. Parents cannot raise their children that way. How can we raise a nation of children that way? We have to inculcate within them 
the concept of living for others. And then their conscience develops. Let's look at this idea. Filial piety is patriotism, but it's just on a small scale. The filial son or daughter will say, my dad and mom, they're the best parents in the whole world. But it doesn't stop with just the feeling of love for your parents. If needed, I will even die for the sake of my parents. That's the action that is willing to take when the heart of filial piety is there. Patriotism is the same thing. It's just bigger. My nation is the best nation in the whole world. And we don't have to compare nation to nation. We just love our nation. But it generates within us some action. If needed, I will die for the sake of my nation. So the patriot, one of the goals of the CVEA program, the patriot, the national-minded student, is not just a soldier on the battlefield with a gun willing to risk his life and die. No. The businessman needs to be a patriot. I, my business adventure is for the sake of my nation. The teacher needs to be a patriot. The religious leader needs to be a patriot. We all need to be patriots. Father Moon said this, moral norms arise from the conscience, not from laws. The foundation of the conscience is goodness itself. So now that we can clearly define an idea of goodness that is interreligious, intercultural, international, unchanging, universal principle, now we can strengthen the conscience within us. So the standard of goodness is the standard of the conscience, he says. Let's look at this again. Good character is when my mind takes dominion over my body. We need both mind and body, but the priority is critically important. The family is more important than the individual. The community is more important than the family. The nation, more important than the community. The world, more important than the nation. And God, of course, is the most important. So we develop good character, we become filial children, we become good citizens, loyal patriots, holy saints, and ultimately children of God. This is the key, and again, the family is the seed for that. This is also scalable. It's the same principle. It just applies on bigger and bigger levels. So once we get this fundamental underlying principle clear, then it can apply throughout societies, nations, and the world. Filial piety. In the Confucian context, filial piety is the root of all goodness. And this sign is on the door as a child leaves the home. They're supposed to carry this with them. It's the last words of their parents that have been inscribed really just above the door as they leave the home. And when they come back, it should have renewed in their hearts. Moses said this. It's in both the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Honor your father and mother so that your days may be long in the land the Lord your God has given you. Why is it if you honor your father and mother, then you can live long? Because you won't do evil things. You will have a conscience that is very, very clear. In Islam, worship God alone and do good to your parents and near of kin. Every religion teaches this concept of filial piety. And when we teach filial piety from a multi-religious perspective, we strengthen this idea within each religion. So there's no longer a competition between religions. It is cooperation and collaboration. And this is for the sake of the students, to give clarity to their education. Let's go back and make a brief review. The mind and body is the pillar. The man-woman relationship is the beam. Let's look at the second principle, the pair system principle between men and women. Everything has a pair system to it. Positive and negative of particles, proton and electron in the atom, cation and anion in molecules. Let's look at the atom. Atoms consist of protons and electrons. And everybody <laughs> always asks, well, where is the neutron? Well, that's, of course, the blue one there. 
the neutron has the weight of a proton plus a little bit more but no charge. So what does that mean? It means the proton and the electron got married. Whoa! And it's the neutron that gives stability to the atom. How about the institution of marriage in society? It plays the same role. It creates stability. And we don't end up running around and running after women that are not our wives or husbands. In the plant world, the stamen and the pistil, if you look at these photographs, it looks like they're all different, different color, different size, different shape, different texture, different smell, but actually they're the same. Stamen and pistil. And that's universal. And the next one, the animal world, male and female, again, in a pair system. Everything is created in pairs. The lions and the deer, the cow, the orangutans, everything is created in pairs. The murats, the rabbits, the raccoon, everything is in pairs. <laughs> the sea lion, the penguin, it's an amazing, the heron. We can go on and on. The ducks and the parrots and the puffins, everything. Uh, uh, the horse fly, the damsel fly, and finally the ladybug. And even in our human society, men and women, well, in the West we have men and women, and here also in Asia, men and women. So, what do we learn from that? It's a very important question is why? Why is that like that? The answer is very important. In the molecular world, the purpose of the pair system is existence. The atom exists when the proton and the electron interact. If they stop interacting, the atom doesn't exist. We have a lot of energy, but no atom. In the plant world, Reproduction. The plants exist through the reproductive system of the stamen and pistil. The honeybee will come and pollinate, but the two parts come together. In the animal world, offspring comes through the relationship of male and female. What is the purpose of human sexuality within humankind? This is a very important question. What is unique? People will say, well, it's for the sake of conceiving children, and there is a certain amount of pleasure. And that is true. But those two elements, pleasure and procreation, are already within the animal kingdom. The uniqueness of human sexuality will include that and must be something greater than that. So this now comes into our element of gender equality. How do we address that issue? Going back what we said at the beginning, Mind and body. Man has mind and body. Woman has mind and body. Meaning my character is more important than my gender. How can we create equality if we want to? Even mathematically? Well, it's an equation. 23 and 23 is 46. And that deals with the conception of children. Mommy will give 23 chromosomes. Daddy will give 23 chromosomes and a new life of infinitely wonderful, beautiful child will be conceived and born in nine months. So they are equal in the conception of that children. After that, mommy and daddy play different roles. And trying to be equal, well, it might actually confuse things rather than help. So let's go back and look. In the Bible, when God created man, he had a clear plan. God created man in his own image. It looks like well, the individual is created in the image of God, and this is true. And many people have looked at that idea. Well, the individual is in the image of God. So every individual is equal before God, and therefore we shouldn't have slaves, we should treat each other equal, skin color doesn't matter, gender doesn't matter. But the second part of this verse is equally important. In the image of God, he created male and female. So both are true. Individually, I am in the image of God as a man. I represent the masculine elements of God. And my wife represents the feminine elements of God. So each of us need to be in the image of God. God's character of selflessness needs to be in our heart. And then we come together, a man and woman together, both individually being in the image of God, coming together and joining together in one, 
fulfill each other and more fully represent the image of God. So both are true. Individually and collectively, we are in the image of God. The Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper and a partner. This doesn't mean someone to cook, and do laundry, and wash the floor. It means helper. Man needs woman to be fully man. I cannot be a father without my wife being a mother. I cannot be a husband without my wife. So for man to be fully man, he needs a woman, and vice versa. The Holy Father made it very, very clear. The image of God is the married couple, the man and the woman. Not only the man, not only the woman, but both of them together. This is the image of God. When a man and a woman celebrate the sacrament of matrimony, God, as it were, is mirrored in them. And this is God's design. We just saw that in the Bible. That's at the very beginning. In the Quran, and everything we have created in pairs, that you may receive instruction. Again, everything is created in pairs. So we're supposed to learn from that. And then God said, He, Allah, created spouses for you and planted affection and mercy between you. So the institution of marriage is not man-made. It is made by Allah or made by God. Buddha is both the father and the mother to the people of this world. And one yin and one yang, this is the Tao, this is the way, this is the marga, this is the logos, this is the shariat, this is the essence of the principle. Everything is created in pairs, and they need to complement and work together. I am the father and the mother of the universe. Again, the pair system is there. Mother Moon put it this way, we marry in order to resemble God. Husband and wife together reflect God's original nature. So, this means we need gender humility, not gender equality. Gender equality, I don't know if it's really possible. You have to measure and calculate and, well, if they're not equal, then I'm justified being resentful. And how can they be equal? Who's going to measure? And Father Moon said, this is not a workable ideal. Why don't we have gender humility, where the husband thinks, I need my wife more than I need myself. And gender cooperation when they raise children. Daddy gives a certain element, mommy gives a certain type of love, their love is different, and the child needs both. The risk-taking love of daddy that gives rules and regulations, and the all-embracing love of mommy, and you can do nothing wrong. The child needs both of these to be embraced and also to be challenged in order to grow healthy. Gender humility, gender cooperation. So the uniqueness of the human sexuality, it includes procreation or conceiving and having children, yes, and there's pleasure to that. But the ultimate purpose within human beings is that we can be in the image of God together. Animals can't do that. We can. This is our unique relationship and the role that human sexuality plays in fulfilling that ideal. Finally, the last point relating to the CVEA is moral behavior. When we look at these two principles, the dual purpose and pair system principle, and connect them together, we get our moral behavior. Individually, learn to live for the sake of others, starting in the relationship of filial piety. And when you apply this principle to the relationship people, man and woman, then change one letter, the I, and make it an O, love for the sake of others, not for myself, love for the sake of others. Let's look. Father Moon said there are four fundamental loves within the family. The parental love, where parents love their children. Conjugal love, between husband and wife. Sibling love, between brother and sister. And children's love, filial love, honoring their parents. In each case, the idea is very simple. Let's take parents and children. Parents live for the sake of their children, not themselves. And children learn to live for the sake of their parents. And in this relationship, two loves are formed. The parental love and the children's love. In the relationship of brothers and sisters, brothers live for the sake of their sisters. 
to protect them. And sisters live for the sake of their brothers, protecting not only themselves, but their lineage, their children. And when they live for each other, then true sibling love is formed. Finally, husband lives for the sake of his wife and wife for the sake of her husband. And they create conjugal love. Father Moon, it says that when we live for the sake of others, we create the four loves that are learned in the family. The concept of free sex, where we would take sexuality outside of marriage and call it free, came from my country, America. I'm sorry for that. But this concept is actually very dangerous. It destroys the family and all four loves. Free sex is not free. It's just selfish sex. I want to have sex with anyone, anytime, anywhere. Well, I hope I don't get pregnant or get a disease or don't accuse me. That's not the purpose of sexuality. It's to bring a man and woman together in the image of God so that that relationship is eternal, absolute and unchanging. So Father Moon said we need a new term and he calls it absolute sex. Before marriage, no sex. After marriage, no sex. <laughs> no sex outside of marriage. So the best way, and we need to teach our children this, the best way to prepare for marriage, and the sociological data backs that up, the best way to prepare for marriage is to reserve sexuality after marriage. There's no doubt about that. So we have to help our children and educate them in that way. Summary. We've talked about two fundamental principles that need to be brought into the education curriculum, the CVEA, in order to fulfill its ideals. And we want, as UPF, we want to be able to make this contribution. We're asking you, as academicians, as professors, as friends of UPF, to help us to review the documents that you've had participate with us on the webinar and let us hear from you how we can actually work together to make our contribution clearer and better for the nation of the Philippines. Live for the sake of others is a dual purpose principle and the sacredness of marriage. This is the pillar and this is the being. When we live for others and honor marriage, those two principles are in the family. The family is the foundation for building a healthy society and world peace. In Father Moon's autobiography, he said, the peaceful family is the building block of the kingdom of heaven. Indeed, family building is nation building. Let us work together. We look forward to your contributions and helping us mold and, and, and clarify our presentation to the Department of Education, uh, seeking ways in which we can help to contribute in raising up the next generation of Filipino students with good character and right conduct, a comprehensive values education approach. Thank you very much. I look forward to seeing you on Thursday, May 14th at 6.30 p.m. Thank you.